Hey, welcome back to the channel, everyone. This is Kevin. And in this week's video, we're going to be discussing uh, the fundamentals of DNS. DNS, that stands for Domain Name System, and it's a way that we can resolve a known domain name like kwtrain.com to an IP address, which can be used to route our packets around the internet. And we'll begin with an overview of DNS and then discuss how it's structured hierarchically. And when working with DNS, there are several different terms that we need to understand. And we're going to spend some time getting to know these DNS terms and then identify various DNS record types, like an A record that's used to specify the IP version 4 address of a known domain name, or an AAAA record that's used to specify an IP version 6 address that corresponds to a specific domain name. And by the way, this training is an excerpt from our Network Plus video training series, which is available at our Udemy site. Just go to kwtrain.com slash Udemy to check out all of the different certification training that we have. Again, that's kwtrain.com slash Udemy. Now let's take a look at DNS and see how it works. I don't know about you, but for me, it's a lot easier to remember the name of a destination on the internet as opposed to the IP address of a destination on the internet. For example, if I want to go to my website at kwtrain.com, I don't know what the IP address is, but routers need to know that. They route based on IP address information, not based on names. So we've got to have some translator that sits in the middle that says, oh, the IP address corresponding to kwtrain.com or wherever you're going is this IP address. In this example, the desktop computer wants to go to the web server, and we're going to pretend that the web server is at kwtrain.com, and the desktop computer does not know that the web server's IP address is 203.0.113.100. It just knows that it wants to go to kwtrain.com, but it does know the IP address of a DNS server. It knows that there is a DNS server available at 192.0.2.10. How does it know that? Maybe we manually configure that in the computer, or maybe it learned it via DHCP when it first booted up and got its IP address information. But somehow that desktop computer knows how to get to the DNS server, but it does not know how to get to kwtrain.com, so it's going to ask the DNS server, hey, can you tell me the IP address for kwtrain.com? It sends a message to that DNS server using port 53, which is what DNS uses, and it's asking, can you give me the IP address for kwtrain.com? And the server responds and says, yes, that has an IP address of 203.0.113.100. And the desktop computer says, awesome, thank you very much. And then it's going to send out its message to the web server. And if we're going to a website that's non-secured, that's going to be port 80. Or if it is secured and we're using HTTPS, that port is going to be 443. But the web server is going to respond and it's going to say, here is the web page that you requested. So the desktop computer, just knowing the name of the web server, was able to reach it thanks to the translation performed by the DNS server. And the name of that web server on the internet of kwtrain.com, or maybe it's ftp.kwtrain.com for an FTP server, if I had one of those, those addresses are called FQDNs, fully qualified domain names. And the worldwide DNS structure is hierarchical. Here's what I mean. We start at the root. There is a root domain, and there are 12 different companies roughly around the world that take care of pointing us to DNS servers that know how to get us to .com addresses, .mil addresses, and so on. Now, these are just a very few examples of top-level domains, or TLDs. .com is a very common one. And these are some that we have in the United States. Other countries, their top-level domain might be a two-letter abbreviation for their country. For example, the United Kingdom might have a .uk as its top-level domain. And under each top-level domain, we have second-level domains. Again, just a very few examples. We might have Amazon.com. So Amazon, that's the second-level domain. And .com, that's the top-level domain. And we as the DNS administrator of maybe our company, for example, kwtrain.com, we could go in and we could say, I want to define certain subdomains within my second level domain. For example, consider purdue.edu. And I'm just making these up, but let's pretend they have a couple of subdomains of CSN business, maybe different colleges within the university. 
CS for Computer Science, so it might be cs.purdue.edu or business.purdue.edu. Those are subdomains. And let's say within the computer science department, they have a World Wide Web server and they have an FTP server. So we could put the actual host name in front of those subdomains. And we could have an address for a server, something like www.cs.purdue.edu. And although we've already discussed several DNS terms in this video, I've got a few more for you that I really want you to know. So you might want to take some notes on these. First up is an authoritative name server. Remember when we had those top level domains like .com pointing down to a second level domain? Well, the main server in charge of that second level domain is called an authoritative name server. Take my website, for example, kwtrain.com. The .com TLD, the top-level domain, it points down to the primary server of kwtrain.com. That's my authoritative name server. And I may just have one primary DNS server for kwtrain.com, or maybe I've got a secondary one. If I've got a secondary one, when there's an update to the primary, we need to replicate that change over to the secondary. And that process of transferring information is called a DNS zone transfer. What typically happens is we've got an update on the primary DNS server and it's going to send a notification over to the secondary DNS server saying, hey, I just wanted to let you know we've had a change. And then typically the secondary DNS server will say, okay, give me that new information. And that's a zone transfer. And the way we've described DNS thus far is I'm providing a known fully qualified domain name, an FQDN. And in return from the DNS server, I would love to get an IP address. However, there are times when we're looking up different services, for example, that we might want to provide an IP address and have returned to us the fully qualified domain name or domain names associated with that IP address. That's possible with a reverse lookup. And finally, consider an internal DNS server and an external DNS server. We may want to have a server that's acting as the DNS server for clients within our organization, not out on the internet. And we might have another name server, an external DNS server, that is going to resolve queries that come in from the internet. And these internal and external DNS servers, they may have different DNS records. Maybe there's a DNS record for the internal DNS server that's not available to the external DNS server. If somebody is on the internet and they want to get to that inside resource and they have to query the inside DNS server to do that, is that possible if someone is working from home? Actually, it might be. An employee might be able to set up a VPN secured connection coming into the organization. And at that point, they would be able to query the internal DNS server and connect to private internal resources, even if they're working from home as an example. And as we're entering DNS information while configuring our second level domain, we're going to be entering different types of DNS records. Let's take a look at those. The most common type that I think of is an A record. This is an address record, and this is the record that translates a fully qualified domain name into a corresponding IP version for address. For example, when we talked about kwtrain.com and we talked about its corresponding IPv4 address, well, that translation was possible due to an A record. What about IP version 6? Well, we also have an IP version 6 address record, but it's an AAAA record type. There's also a canonical name or a C name record type. This is another name for an existing record. Maybe we've already got an A record for kwtrain.com, but we want it to go by another name as well, like kevinwallacetraining.com. Well, we could have a C name record that's an alias of kwtrain.com. And within kwtrain.com, we have email accounts. And we could have an MX record to point to mail servers for our domain. A pointer record or a PTR record, that works hand in hand with a C name record. And it's often used when performing a reverse DNS lookup. So with the reverse DNS lookup, instead of saying, here's the fully qualified domain name, what's the IP address? We say, here's the IP address, what's the corresponding fully qualified domain name? An SOA record or start of authority record, this gives us some good information or documentation about this site. It tells us, for example, things like the email address of the administrator. We can see what server is the primary name server for this domain. We can get information about different types of timers that might be configured. So think of an SOA record as sort of an informational record. There's also a text record or a TXT record. 
and the original intent for this record type was to contain some descriptive text that we as humans could read. But more recently, it's been used to carry attributes that have meaning to the computer that requested the information. A service locator record, or an SRV record, that's somewhat similar to that MX record we talked about for email service, except it's more generic. It can point to hosts providing a variety of services, while the MX record was used just for email. And finally, you can specify optionally an NS, or a name server record. That tells the DNS zone to use, for security purposes, specific name servers. And that's a look at DNS, the translator between fully qualified domain names and IP addresses.